Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, and welcome to the uh, third talk of this Quantum Algorithms Day. Um, the speaker is Alex Grillo uh, from Amsterdam, who will uh, be telling us about quantum statistical query learning. Please go ahead. So first I'd like to thank for the organizers for putting up this nice workshop and thanks for having me here. And I'll present this joint work on quantum statistical query learning. Uh, in, and that's a joint work with Srinivasan of Nasalam and Hei Yuan. And the context of our result is, uh, is okay, it lies in the field of learning theory. And in learning theory, we're trying to understand how hard or how easy it is to learn a function when you're just giving input and output samples uh, for this function. So let me explain this a bit more precisely. So we have a fixed and non family of functions f. So for instance, you have, uh, you can think f as being all the possible linear functions. But then we pick some specific function f uh, from, this, uh, from this family of functions, and this f is unknown to the learning algorithm. And then the idea is that we want to devise an algorithm that receives as inputs pairs x, i, comma f of x i, where each x i is drawn from some distribution d. You can think that d is known or unknown, like you have different models, but let's say that d is fixed. And the goal is to output some hypothesis h that is close to f with high probability. So let me be a bit more precise. What you want is that uh, with high probability, our algorithm outputs some uh, function h such as such that if you pick X according to the same distribution as the training distribution, then the probability that F is different of H, it, it should be small. It should be smaller than some parameter epsilon. And this model is, is well studied in classical learning theory. And our goal is trying to, to um, understand how much time or how many samples do we need in order to learn every function in this family. And as I said, this model was very studied um, in uh, classical learning theory and uh, several models, but here I'll just skip to this vanilla, this vanilla setup that I mentioned to you. But of course, you in a quantum workshop, so we're not interested in the classical learners, but in the quantum ones. And um, we have defined, like it has been defined in a model for quantum learning in, in the way that uh, you, you now have a quantum learning algorithm that again wants to learn a function f that's unknown from a family of function calligraphic f here. But instead of giving classical samples x i comma f of x i, we have now the superposition over all possible um, x and f, f of x. But our goal is still to output this hypothesis, this, uh, this classical circuit uh, that we call the hypothesis, such that uh, it has the same properties that we had before, like uh, with high probability over the, the randomness of the algorithm. Um, the, 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 the H um, uh, is equal to F uh, when you draw an X uh, from the right distribution. And again, we want to understand how much time or how many samples we need to learn that. And this model was studied, uh, not as extensively as classical ones, but we'll, we know several results where, um, where classes uh, that uh, are solvable by quantum learners, but not by classical ones, uh, efficiently at least. But uh, also, we, we know uh, very recently you have also uh, been able to to show some hardness. So there are some cases where we cannot even uh, learn with these quantum samples. But but what's surprising is that there are some some classes that are very important. So for instance, uh, the, the class of uh, noise linear functions that uh, that uh, classically they are expected to be hard, and uh, we have the post quantum cryptography. The, schemes based on the hardness of learning this uh, learning noise linear functions. But quantumly, quantum samples are very powerful and gives us the power of, of learning such type of uh, um, uh, family functions, uh, um, uh, such a uh, family of functions. 
And uh, given the power of this quantum sample, our goal is trying to understand. So, is giving quantum samples too, too powerful? So, what are the um, so how, first, how feasible are they? How can we create them? And uh, the question is how how where does the power of having quantum samples come from? Does it come from having a lot of samples and being able to perform measurements that, that entangle all of them, or where do they come from? And in order to study these questions, then we define, we define a new model and uh, that we call the quantum statistical Fourier model. And uh, in this model, instead of ha having access to, to these quantum samples and being able to perform an arbitrary quantum algorithm on it, we have now a classical learner that is able to, to uh, that, that, that chooses some measurements and um, up, M1 up to an L. And for technical reasons, like of course, this, uh, these measurements are like the operators have to be bounded. Um, but once this classical learner chooses this, uh, these observables, then uh, she receives the, uh, some values alpha one up to alpha L, such that alpha I is, um, is a good approximation of measuring the quantum sample using the measurement MI. And uh, this good approximation is bounded by some parameter theta that, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, tau, that is, um, that is called the tolerance of this learning algorithm. And again, what we want here is that uh, when, when given this, uh, these values of one, one up to alpha L, this classical learning algorithm should be able to output some hypothesis H that matches with uh, the function f. Uh, sorry, there's a table here, not so cf, that matches the, the function f with a high enough probability. So first of all, we should ask why is this model uh, interesting? And the first thing, is this, this model generalizes the classical statistical uh, query model, which is a, a model that uh, has been also studied uh, in the classical setting and has provided separations between type models of learning and uh, has, connection, has connections to several concepts in, in classical complexity theory and, and quantum learning, and classical complexity theory and learning theory. And just to, to, for completeness, the classical case, instead of choosing these measurements, these, uh, the, the learner chooses some functions, G1 up to GL. And now we receive uh, the answers uh, alpha one up to alpha L, where alpha I is very close to picking X at random uh, uh, for, from the same training distribution. And then we, uh, uh, we compute uh, GI of X, F of X. Okay, so, so the idea is that this quantum if we pick this MI to be diagonal, then we're back to, to GI. So this quantum version, at least it generalizes the classical one, but it allows us to measure uh, these quantum samples and also in different bases. So that, that gives at least, uh, so gives, that gives us hope that this quantum model is at least, uh, that it is strictly more powerful than the classical one. The second thing that's uh, interesting about this learning model is because it inherently splits the learning algorithm in two parts. One uh, quantum part that we could think that, okay, it, it is delegated to a quantum server, whereas, uh, and, and this post-processing, that's a classical part that could be done by a classical, uh, a classical client. And finally, one thing that is interesting because this type of measurement it uh, forces that we don't measure, uh, like uh, this model forces that we don't do a lot of weird things to the quantum samples. So they are limiting a lot what, uh, what, what, what you can do with a quantum sample. So once you define the model and okay, you, you, when you define it, you see that, uh, okay, it's a natural model to define, but uh, what can we use, the, is, use it for? So, so the first thing that we do in our paper is showing that this model is somewhat useful. And it, 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 uh, because first it is connected with uh, quantum learning, the noisy model. And um, in this case, uh, like uh, in, in this type of um, in this uh, type of uh, quantum learning, 
instead of having the 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 standard uh, quantum sample as I mentioned before, now we have that the, the value of the function is flipped is flipped by a value bx, where bx are random IID var uh, variables that uh, uh, just that okay you flip the, this value with priority p or relieve as it is with priority to one minus p. And this is called as a noisy quantum sample. And the first thing that we can show is that actually, uh, if you have a, a quantum statistical query learner, then we also have a, a quantum noisy learner for some range of noise. And the idea of the proof is simple. So um, imagine that we have this uh, QSQ learner that makes the queries M1 up to ML. Uh, and now we want to devise this, uh, this uh, like uh, to implement this quantumized learner. So this quantumized learner will receive these copies of this um, of this noisy quantum sample. And whenever it receives these these samples, oops, it groups uh, into. Uh, so the idea is that with these samples, the 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 quantum noise learner will try to estimate the value of each mi. So it will compute, so like it will measure um, uh, groups of this uh, psi hat C corresponding to mi, and you have an estimate of, of alpha i that we will manage to show that is close to, to the measurement of that uh, psi C on mi. Once you have these, uh, these uh, estimations of alpha i, then that, that are good enough, we can just run the quantum statistical query algorithm, and we will have the uh, we will have the hypothesis uh, by assumption. Okay. So, okay, this, but this is a simple um, property of these quantum statistical query learners. And, but we're also able to show that uh, this model is very powerful. And the power of this, um, uh, of this model comes that we were able to, to estimate the Fourier coefficients of the function. So what we're able to show is that for any function, um, when you have the uniform superposition, or when you pick the distribution over the axis to be the uniform uh, distribution, then for um, for every subset of strings t, we can uh, have a tau estimation over of the of the Fourier coefficients of all the subsets of t using uh, one quantum statistical query learning with tolerance of tau. And uh, if you know a bit about the quantum learning, the PACT model doing Fourier sampling is one of the main uh, techniques that you use to learning algorithms. So it means that all, so uh, this technical lemma that we prove allows us to, to devise a lot of learning algorithms for, for, for very interesting complexity classes. So for instance, we're able to show that uh, we can learn parities in the quantum statistical query model, while classically, uh, we know that exponentially number of queries are, are required. We're able to learn k juntas, and k juntas are functions that depend on only k out of the n variables. So you have an n bits of input, but your function only depend, depends on k of them. And uh, what we show is that okay, you can also uh, we can reduce this problem to do, to, to for sampling again, and then we can use our QSQ algorithm. Uh, but classically, we we actually don't know how to learn your juntas even if you have access to the sample. So instead of having like the, just estimations, if I have the samples, I still cannot, uh, I still don't know, we still don't know how to, how to learn home test. And finally, we are also able to show uh, QSQ learners for BNFs. And again, this compared to, to the exponential uh, lower bound that we have classically. So on top of uh, okay, showing uh, wh what you can do in this model, we're also able to characterize what the query complexity of learning some function. 
And the idea is that, okay, class, we know that cl in classical uh, statistical query uh, learning model, uh, the query complexity can be character fully characterized up to some polynomial factors by some, uh, some um, measure called S2 dimension. The definition of S2 dimension is very technical and uh, due to time constraints, I won't define it here. But uh, so the, the idea is that for every function, we have an upper lower bound on how, how many queries you need to learn it. What we're able to show is that quantumly, um, we need at least log of this SQ dimension to learn any function. So we have a logarithmic, uh, like the, the lower bound is logarithmic on the classical lower bound. And we actually showed that this lower bound is tight. And, and, and the idea is that showing that, for instance, for parities, uh, the learning hours in that, that I mentioned in the previous slide uh, actually ma uh, matches uh, this lower bound. And, uh, okay, and one extra thing that we're able to do, and, and it is interesting, is that not only we're able to, to, to fully characterize the query complex of the quantum statistical query model, but we can also use it to prove lower bounds on the communication complexity under the product distributions. Uh, when uh, in the communication complexity, you're interested in the inverse exponential bias. And uh, uh, so again, I don't want to, to get into these technical details, but uh, before we had lower bounds that were good, but uh, for, for inverse polynomial bias. And what we're able to show is that even in this small, um, bias regime, this tiny bias regime, uh, we're also able to use quantum learning to, to provide uh, lower bounds on classical communication complexity. And um, yeah, finally, uh, our, what we're able to show is that uh, our quantum statistical query model, it is connected to, to differential privacy. And uh, differential, differential privacy, we, we try to understand uh, if uh, we want to study how to have aggregated queries, but in a private way. So the question that we're trying to, 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 to address is that uh, if you can learn information about individuals on only giving queries and aggregated data. And the definition of um, differential privacy, so, so the idea is that we want that, uh, the definition of, of differential privacy says that if you have uh, some database and uh, you have an aggregated query, so let's say you want to know the sum or, or some, some statistical property of this database, um, the, the, this type of query, it is differentially private. If, if you change the value of a single individual, then, then the distribution of the output should uh, should be very close to to the to the original uh, output distribution. So here the idea is that you don't want to answer exactly the the value. For instance, if you're asking the sum over the elements of the database, it's not that you want to to answer now the exact sum, but just a, a very good estimation of it. But uh, you, you want to have these mistakes. To, to uh, because we want the, the privacy of each individual uh, to, to, to remain intact. And there is a very, uh, so the differential privacy is something that uh, has been very important lately. Uh, and it has been used by several companies of Apple and uh, Google. And one of the main techniques that we have here, for instance, is the Laplace mechanism where the idea is that you just add the Laplacian, Laplacian noise to the aggregated data, and then you can show that uh, this makes already the model to, to be like a, your, your queries to be differentially private. And what has been shown in the classical setting is that if you have a classical statistical query learning algorithm, it actually implies that you have a differentially private, sorry, yeah, I missed the word private, you have a differentially private learning algorithm. So meaning that uh, um, by a private learning algorithm, the idea is that again, you, you now 
change the, uh, you're able to change one classical sample by, by something else, and this should not affect uh, the, uh, the distribution output of your out learning algorithm. And given the importance of uh, differential privacy in the classical setting, it has been recently uh, upgraded or uplifted to, to the quantum setting by Arons and Rothblum. And this definition, uh, in this definition, we have a fixed set of product states. So we have, uh, we have a set of states phi i up to phi k. And you say that uh, a quantum algorithm is, uh, is differentially private, quantum differentially private, if um, if the algorithm behaves almost the same, so with some statistical difference, on uh, whenever it's given the input phi one up to phi k, or if you pick one i and then replace phi i to some phi i prime from this family as well. So that is that for um, so just to to uh, repeat. So that is that whenever uh, you you will say the learning algorithm is differentially private when replace some of the phi i's by phi i prime, then the statistical um, uh, distance of the, of the output should be, should be small, uh, of the output before and after uh, replacing should be small. And uh, what we're able to show is that uh, actually these QSQ learners also imply differentially private quantum learners. And the proof is actually uh, this, uh, almost the same as this noisy, ver like a QSQ implies noise learning. But on top of that, we need just to use this Laplacian mechanism in a, in a, uh, in a specific way. So, so the idea is that you, you're estimating this, uh, the, the values, but, but then you should uh, add uh, this Laplacian noise in order to make things uh, private. And just to finish, I'd like to, to end with some open questions. So we know that classically, there are several separations between classical pack learning from classical, uh, uh, from classical statistical theory learning. And uh, currently, we don't know any quantum uh, learning problem uh, for, for which you have this separation. So uh, we don't have any problem for which having the quantum samples actually help. And this is related to the question, is there quantum learning beyond Fourier sampling? Because as I said, we know how to do Fourier sampling in the QSQ model, QSQ model. So maybe to, to, to have the separation, we have to go beyond this technique. Uh, uh, a very interesting open question is those, uh, if we can do quantum learning, but now we've only had classical samples, so we have a quantum learning algorithm but with classical samples. And this could have interesting applications such as uh, constructing quantum queries from, uh, sorry, it, it, could, it could be used to, to construct, uh, this could be constructed by, uh, this could be implemented by constructing quantum queries from the classical ones. And this could have uh, some applications for memory and runtime trade-off. Uh, and finally, yeah, okay, just to, to wrap up. So classically, there are connections between learning theory and several other uh, topics in theoretical computer science. Can we, can we have, do you have these connections also in the quantum setting? And with that, I'd like to, to finish. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you very much, Alex, um, for that nice talk. So I think, um, well, to the audience, if you have any questions, please post them on, um, on the Slack channel. I will monitor that for questions. I think there are some um, general questions about the definition of the um, quantum statistical querying model. So mm -hmm. maybe if you could bring that definition back up. Okay. okay. So, the, so here the learner is classical, right? Uh, so I'm yes. not, I'm not able to do any quantum uh, computing. It's now one question was why, um, why do you require the measurements to be non-entangling? Oh, because, oh, the, the point is it's not entangling, like you just have, like you have an MI. Yeah. You have an estimation of measuring one quantum sample using one measurement. You don't have multiple, you, you know, this measurement is not acting on, on several copies, just one of them. 
right? So you have a number of copies of the same, uh, or identical copies of the quantum sample, and you perform different measurements. So the need, no, okay, okay. In this model, okay, yeah. we don't specify how we have these estimates, but yeah. of course, okay, the, ideally, what, what, what would happen in practice is that someone has the, a lot of copies and just estimate them. Right. So while in the in classical learning you're looking at sample size in the sense of you have a number of different samples, here your sample size is the number of copies of the identical uh, sample. Is yes, that right? Yes. Yes. I see. Okay. Um, and are, are these? You say learner chooses MI through ML. Is there any restriction other than that? No, okay. Uh, we also want them. So yeah, I did, maybe I didn't stress that. We also want M, uh, ideally M one up to M L should be efficiently uh, 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 implemented, implementable. So the idea is that okay, you choose a measurement by describing a polynomial time circuit that uh, that implements it. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm looking out for other questions. Um, I. Don't see any others at the moment. So maybe if you could come back to the, your final slide with the open questions. There, was mm -hmm. a, there are a num number of interesting things there. Oh, I wonder. Sure. Oh. Okay, yeah. um, so number three, quantum learning with classical samples. This is kind of inverting what you're doing. I mean, you're... Uh, yeah, well, I, I think, okay. You, Sorry, you're not talking I, I think about we're giving one step in yeah. I think we're giving one step in this direction. Yeah. So th yeah. instead now we don't have a quantum sample, we're having these stati classical statistics. Yeah, yeah, I think classical samples is the next step. I see, I see. Okay. Uh, and can you remind me what LWE is? Oh, this is learning with, uh, okay, this is called learning with errors, but uh, uh. The, the idea is that you have a uh, noisy linear function. So you have the linear function, but now you add some noise on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And okay. uh, yeah, LWE is one of these like leading candidates for post quantum cryptography. Right. Okay, thank you. I think, uh, thank you very much. Let me give you a round of applause on behalf of everybody out there. And, uh, thank you very much. All right. And we'll see, see you all and, uh, in the next event. Can I stop here? Yeah.